Welcome, Courtsiders, to episode 12. This is a bit of a Christmas special, so as we're thinking of all things Christmas, we thought what better stuff to talk about than nutrition and food particularly as we explore this whole topic of what is it that we fuel our kids with that help them then express themselves on the pitch, on the court, in the pool, wherever it is that they play their sport. But what also are we fueling them with that helps them sustain a level of intensity and energy that helps them get the most out of the sport that they enjoy. This is a really in-depth interview where we look at kind of how the body processes food and what food we might want to consider fueling up our kids with. And yes, we live with that tension, don't we, constantly as parents, as what might be great food for them to eat might not always be what they want to eat. Uh, and so we do explore that in today's uh, episode. Edin Sahovic uh, is a sports nutritionist, and we met him out here in Barcelona a couple of months back, so we desperately wanted him to be on the podcast. He's worked with our son and a lot of the players here at the Barcelona Tennis Academy. Uh, and all I want to say right at the beginning is before we dive into this podcast is we applied some of the learning instantly off the back of when we recorded this a few weeks ago and we got some really good staggering uh, impact off the back of it around energy levels for Elijah in a tournament that he played there a few days later. This really is a great in-depth podcast. So welcome to the Christmas edition of Courtside. My name is Andy Burns. Our guest today is uh, Edin Sohovic and this is the Courtside podcast. So welcome to uh, Courtside Podcast. It is uh, my pleasure to have uh, Edin uh, Shiovic. Have I done your surname correct there? Yeah, you got it. Perfect. Come Thank on. Thank you for having me. An, a northern accent butchering everybody's surname in the world. Uh, but there we go. So <clears throat> thank you so much for joining us. And so as a way of introduction, um, uh, who are you, where are you, and what on earth in the world of sport are you involved in? Uh, so my name is Edin Sohovic, as you already mentioned before. I am a young sport nutritionist based out of Vancouver, uh, BC, Canada. Um, and so my um, experience has taken me from getting my degree in at Ryerson University in Toronto, yeah. Canada. Um, and I work towards uh, teaching the general population as well as elite athletes on uh, – proper nutrition and how it can affect their performance uh, as well as their uh, lifestyle, their energy levels. Uh, and I just teach them to make the best decisions that they possibly can um, using what they have in front of them. Um, so I've worked with a ton of athletes uh, across Europe, across um, North America as well. Um, and I'm currently working still with a lot of uh, I, I, I won't name my clients as no. I do uh, like to keep that uh, hush hush, but uh, it, they, they are quite a few uh, clients within professional tennis, uh, professional basketball as well. Um, and I work with clients um, as well as the general population and in and around uh, certain um, athletic related events as well. Cool. So, so tell us about your uh, journey into kind of the area of what I would term sport nutrition. What what led you into that field? Were you a, uh, an active participant in sports and then found an interest in this, or was this the thing that always had grabbed you? Right. Um, I mean, I guess I can go by saying uh, I started in tennis. Um, yeah. So I, I played. I played. I would say an elite level of tennis, uh, junior tennis. Um, until about 19, I was playing very competitively, um, trying to, you know, you know, the, the story for yeah, juniors yeah. trying to break through somewhere. Um, and, and I kind of realized one day, like, man, I just ate this uh, and, and I'll give you a quick story. It's, uh, I ate a burger. I'm not going to name the brand, but <laughs> it's, a fast food it's a billion dollar company. So I had a fast food burger before playing. Um, and I very quickly, and by quickly, I mean 10 minutes in on the, onto the match court, realized how bad that was for me. Yeah. I started, I started feeling like I was going to vomit and, you know, surely enough, 10, 10 minutes after that I did vomit and then I was cramping up and, um, and I realized very quickly, I was like, okay, like that's a bad decision. Yeah. It wasn't very much, you know, oh my God, nutrition, but it was the first time I remember and I was maybe only 10, um, when I remember 
God, why did I make that decision? Why did my mom let me get away with that? Even though I'm sure she told me like a million times that was an <laughs> awful, awful decision. So from that point, um, I kind of moved towards, uh, you know, further on in my life, I just started paying attention to it more. That was kind of around the time when, you know, things started coming around, like Rafa Nadal saying, you know, I eat a bowl of pasta, the same thing with oil, and that's it every single day before a match. And then, you know, I started eating that. and That wasn't quite vibing for me as well yeah. as I wanted it. But it was definitely a lot better than the bur the burger. So, um, and then shortly thereafter, I was about 14, I think it would have been, well, 2009, um, I got diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Okay. Um, and that was the real game changer for me because uh, getting type 1 diabetes, for those of you that don't know, it's an autoimmune disease that affects the beta cells in your pancreas. Uh, and so it allows you, or it rather inhibits you from being able to digest sugars properly. Um, uh, and so having that, you know, you have to really monitor, be on top of um, the carbohydrates, counting them, understanding them so that you can self-medicate um, and making sure you track everything that you eat. Yeah. That actually was one of the biggest blessings for me because not only was I in a bad um, place in terms of my health for such a long period of time, uh, but it did allow me to, the education to learn my body a little bit more. It forced me to have to, whereas most other kids maybe don't, yeah. uh, unless something goes wrong, right? Um, and so that was the point at which uh, I realized this is something that I, I want to get into. Like I realized the uh, meeting with my, you know, my dietitian in the hospital um, in, in Ontario, in where I grew up in Hamilton. Um, you have to you have to visit a nurse and, uh, you know, an endocrinologist and, uh, kind of a team of people that helps you, um, make sure that you are on the right track in terms of your goals for your diabetes and managing it, uh, just so that you're doing all right. And those people together kind of made me realize the food was the most interesting part for me. Uh, I really enjoyed, you know, the idea that there's a, everything, there's a, um, there's even, there's, a formula almost yeah it was not specific to everyone but you know there was my formula existed yeah. I didn't know what it was but I had it and that that really interested me um, so there's a personal driver that leads you into this kind of area of work it, definitely um, so I, I have done a lot of work with I challenge diabetes it's an organization here in Canada uh, led by a former Olympian and my friend Chris Jarvis mm -hmm. um, you know, volunteering, or I should say not working with him, but volunteering with him um, really gave me a sense of satisfaction. You're working with kids that also have type 1 diabetes, and you're realizing how important it is to have a role model that also faces some sort of turmoil, yeah. whether that's the same thing you have, um, or, you know, it, he's just, <clears throat> there's someone to help you make a decision. And I think that having that, um, especially in sport, using sport as the medium to do so, um, I, I was really intrigued yeah. in. And so I guess you could say it's a very personal drive. I do enjoy working with kids. I work with adults as well. Uh, I should mention, I do that quite a bit. Um, but I very often, uh, am working with children, especially recently. And, you know, it's very fulfilling for me, uh, to, to see kids, you know, learn more about themselves, learn more about their bodies, learn more about the world and how it works. Um, and to me, that's kind of what drives me to continue. Yeah. So, so, so is that how you tend to describe kind of the work that you do? It's understanding your body better. Yeah, of course. It's educating, uh, it's educating the client or the person on uh, understanding your body and how the things around it affect the body yeah. in, order to, in order to use all of that information to make a decision on your own. Yeah, I'm. My work doesn't include um, me making anyone's meals, um, <laughs> so I, I don't make anyone's meals. And I, and I often, you know, I have done it, uh, and I still do it, but only upon you know strict um, kind of guidelines. You know, maybe yeah. if they're referred to me by a naturopath or something like that, um, will I actually make a meal plan? Um, but I typically give guidelines, you know, I give kind of check boxes, things that are just easier to function with on a day to day basis. So if I give you a meal plan and I say, Hey, you're supposed to be having, I'm going to throw something random out here. Um, you're supposed to be having chicken and rice or fish and fish and quinoa. And you don't like one, you don't like quinoa yeah. or 
or you don't have access to it, which in a lot of, especially if you want to take a tennis player, for example, they travel a lot. Like what are the, what's the likelihood the hotel has that in the, um, as access, uh, which is the, the issue with most athletes, right. Is, is traveling. Um, so, so that, that's kind of, you know, it's a fun game of how can I f- teach them to make their own decision given what they have mm. and, and constantly being that form of support, yeah. which, um, I pride myself on, I think I'm always available for all of my clients, you know, give it, give me a couple hours, especially for the ones that are in different time zones, uh, if I'm asleep, but I don't sleep often, so I will definitely <laughs> respond. Well, uh, you've kind of hit the nail on the head there, but with the the traveling, so whether an, an elite a- athlete, performance athlete uh, on the road uh, that we see, those kind of stars who are permanently traveling, you're hitting various hotels or getting to countries late at night and there's not that much to, to eat, so you are having to pick up some fuel. Um, <clears throat> through to us as parents, uh, early in the morning, a tournament's happening on a Saturday morning, what will they eat? <laughs> What can we get them to eat before they leave the house? Uh, and when we arrive, will there be anything there? I can remember uh, six, seven months ago, we were at, we were at a tournament with uh, with Elijah, and because of rain, the tournament lasted a lot longer, and there was no canteen facility or anything there. So you know, you force feeding him, uh, which he appreciated the time a whole lot of uh, chocolate bars and stuff. But you know, the, the crash after it was quite impressive. Yeah, so I, I know Elijah likes his Nutella. Oh, yeah, um, he loves his Nutella. <laughs> yeah, I guess I should mention I've had the pleasure of meeting Elijah when in Barcelona. Um, yeah, no, he uh, he and along with that, that that is the kind of the narrative for most athletes yeah. uh, globally, especially juniors. It's very tough because um, as a parent, I would say it's very difficult because you want to please your child. And I understand that I am not a parent, but I can empathize with parents that – you know, you want the best for your kid. You want what your kid likes, um, but it's not always the best idea. Yeah. And but it might sometimes be the only option. So in that scenario, obviously you kind of you don't want to. Uh, if I could give a kind of first tip to parents is, don't stress about it. Um, yeah. the, it's kind of the thing I tell clients when they're trying to lose weight is uh, you didn't, you know, gain all that weight from that one meal. So it won't be that one meal that makes the difference in all of the performance. Granted, you know, it could be like my meal, the yeah. burger example that I gave where they, it results in um, uh, sickness or something like that. But it, it won't be the one that ends his career. Uh, so n- not <laughs> stressing about that is very important. Um, and understanding understanding that you, you've got to ha- kind of be there as a support system, not a yeah. police. Um, that's very important in the re- building the relationship with parents and food. Uh, and helping them uh, remain a trustworthy source yeah. of information yeah. because the parents have to be the ones that are providing all that information for their kids. Um, and, and I completely recommend it, of course. Uh, those are the biggest support systems. You look at any um, any any of my clients that are kids and you think they're cooking for themselves? Uh, I'd say no. 90% no, right? Um, so, so I would say the first tip, you know, don't panic. Um, and I should say, again, I'll kind of just throw this out there. If, if you miss anything, uh, a lot of the stuff that I put, um, I put on my Instagram as well for um, random uh, information or random facts. You can always find it on there uh, at Edin Sohovic Nutrition or even my personal account, which is just at Edin Sohovic. We'll put and a link on that on the, on the website. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> and then I'll even put a link for my website up there as well where I'll be sharing sometimes some recipes and, and stuff like that as well. Okay. So um, if we can... Just diving. So the the reason why I was really keen to chat with you, because <clears throat> obviously we'd met at Barcelona, and uh, my son's met you, and there's been a couple of other of the players have hung out with you and have had support from you, and the team here highly recommend you. Is this for me nutrition? The fuel that we put in is mm-hmm. is an area of of conversation, or what you see a lot for us as courtside parents. Um, you either get the the sugar dealers, as I sweet dealers on the court side, parents yeah, coming yeah. along with a whole lot of um, gummy sweets trying to fuel their kids through the day. Um, <clears throat> but I, I guess as as you mentioned, Elijah, because you you've met him, what we're starting to realise now, as his matches are getting longer, he is he's great in the first set and a half, and then you mm-hmm. start to see the tailing off. And so I'm very conscious watching him of are we giving him the right fuel that will help sustain the level in set 
later two and then possibly a tie break as the energy level he has in in set one and so this whole area is is an area of, of interest for me particularly as you've had burger gate if i can call it that we we yeah, we, we had we we had hot chocolate gate we um <clears throat> We'd, uh, we'd had a late night the night before. We had an early morning tournament, and I did what all wise parents did. I force-fed him Cocoa Pops and uh, near enough a gallon of hot chocolate to try and sugar him up. Uh, by the time we got to the tournament, uh, he retched <laughs> a sea of, oh. <clears throat> of milk chocolate all out the uh, the front of the uh, tournament, which meant uh, all plans of performing today were, were totally and utterly written off. So uh, I'm coming in this with uh, an obvious area of interest how do we fuel our kids in the sport that we love better but also i'm coming in with a whole lot of ignorance because if i had my way i'd just keep on uh, topping them up with chocolate yeah yeah for sure so my, um so my first question to you all... is is this is how, how does the body process food the uh, fuel sure, that yeah, we I give it gonna, yeah i was gonna say um maybe it helps if i kind of step back and yeah uh, talk, talk more of like a general um education piece yeah. how digestion kind of works that'd be great um so it starts actually when you're nowhere near the food um so it starts when you're thinking about it looking at the food smelling the food there's actually uh, processes that happen in your body uh, you start feeling like you're for example if i have a chocolate bar i'm looking at or i smell mom's cooking in the kitchen yeah uh, i start salivating that's actually a process of digestion and that's where it all begins yeah so you start salivating that's a way for you to chemically and mechanically with using your teeth break down the food. Then the food moves as we call it a bolus and um, it, it moves in like waves or balls. Yeah. Um, but it moves as a wave motion through your esophagus using peristalsis. This is something yeah. kind of a fun fact for folks. If you're upside down and you're chewing and you swallow because of peristalsis, it can still make it to your stomach, even if you're upside down. So, Which is, which is helpful for trapeze artists and the like to keep yeah. eating as they perform. Exactly. Yeah. If that, if that, <laughs> a, so that helps for not, you know, choking and dying right there. On as the well. Stomach. Yeah. Kids like to eat in really weird positions. So don't stress <laughs> about it. Um, so, and when that happens, it kind of breaks, makes its way down um, all the way into your stomach where, as most people would stereotypically think of where most of the digestion happens. Yeah. Um, what's interesting to note here is a lot of the breakdown of food happens here. Uh, a lot of the absorption does not happen right. here. So you still, uh, I'll, I'll keep you updated on the timelines because kind, of, kind of as we go along, but just so you have an idea of how long this all takes. So it's in your stomach. This, is, this process has only taken a couple minutes. Um, at this point, you have a mixture of uh, what we know as gastric acids or stomach acids. Yeah. Uh, it's just kind of a mixture of hydrochloric acid, potassium chloride, and, and sodium chloride, and, it, and it's just kind of churning around. Your stomach actually does move, right? So it's moving, churning it around, which is called mechanical breakdown. Yeah. So it's mechanically breaking it down and using the chemicals. So the chemical that's all broken down into um, something that can be pushed out or emptied out of your um stomach so this is called gastric emptying so anytime i say gastric it's re referring yeah. to the stomach uh, so gastric emptying takes about two to six hours to empty the stomach so already thinking you know those those cocoa puffs the reason they came up is because if he was already trying to play within those two hours <laughs> it can take two to six for just to get out of the stomach right? yep. um and so i've noted that one i've noted to self <laughs> No, no to self, two to six, yeah. Uh, and so then after emptying, it kind of goes into the duodenum of the small intestine, where this is where a bulk of um, your actual absorption of nutrients happens. The ones that we, I mean, not the ones that we care about, but I won't go into too much detail yeah. on the tail end of digestion. Yep. Um, because that is a lengthy process. However, um, this is where... Um, of your macronutrients, so your carbohydrates, your fats, proteins, this is where they are getting absorbed. Um, so all these materials are getting absorbed in finger-like protrusions along your small intestine, which just for fun, just so you know, uh, the average adult length of a small intestine is actually six meters. Wow. So more or less two of you is folded up within yeah. here, um, or like it's like a half a foot long um, area of your torso. Um and so foods may take 
longer. I don't know if I mentioned this, but foods may take longer or shorter. That two to six hour range is due to, you know, what it is due yep. to the nature of the food. Uh, if it's a liquid, obviously far less than if it's a solid fatty, um, item uh, or food so um, just as a, as a point that liquids will get uh, absorbed into the body naturally quicker than breaking down solids do so if you're trying to get energy in is it better to take it in liquid form or in solid so that would depend uh, on what your goal is with the food uh, and that would also depend on what the liquid is and what the yeah what the food is um, so I'm, I'm sorry I'm gonna give you fair warning a lot of the questions that people ask and do kind of start with a it depends yeah, and then yeah. I have to break it down very specifically but um, for example if it's if it's like an orange juice versus eating an orange yeah this is the best comparison yes the liquid will be faster okay uh, because there's less breakdown necessary to get it into your body um, but if we're looking at uptake of nutrients that can vary due to gastric emptying due to um, whatever your food that you're eating along with it, if you're eating any food along with it. So there's a lot of varying factors. Um, so the finger-like protrusions that I mentioned, the folds in your small intestine, these actually allow for, because it's in a um, almost like a wave-like pattern uh, along your small intestine, this increases your uh, surface area for uptake of mm -hmm. nutrients. Uh, so this is very good um, when in here, the gallbladder and the pancreas are also um, releasing some chemicals um, to help um, uptake and further break down the food um, into your small intestine. And this kind of typically takes the food at this point is called chyme or chyme is how it's spelled. Yeah. Um, and at this point, you are looking at for it to pass through this process where you've actually absorbed your carbohydrates, your proteins, your fats. This is another three to five hours you're looking at um, before it exits into the large intestine. So a quick so, question. So sorry. So a quick question on that. Often within, if I just pick on the sport that we're around, because this isn't just for tennis parents, but it is kind of dominates the conversations because it's where we live. Is very often you get that stereotypical picture of the tennis player eating a banana in between in between games. Of course. Are they genuinely getting any benefit from that? banana right then or there or is that more to do with uh getting away of maybe the sensation of having to empty a stomach because what you're saying is it seems like that banana will have no beneficial effect on that current match um on the current match <clears throat> yeah yes on the current match yes but also dependent on how long the match is okay yeah so if you're looking at the pro, pro tennis players the reason why they start eating them so soon in the match is because oftentimes they're planning ahead okay yeah, yeah um, I see. is it giving you fuel right then and there no but a lot of the time um it's important to feel uh satiety to feel um, that relief of hunger yep uh, so it, it's very important to kind of clear your body of that otherwise there have been a lot of um there's actually a lot of research on that that shows um that performance it, and it's uh, peer-reviewed uh, as well that shows that the performance um increases with um with the sense of fullness okay so so anytime uh, or rather i should say that the, the evidence shows that if a athlete is ever feeling hungry their perceived rate of exhaustion is you know always uh, much higher and they're always uh, per they're performing at a lower rate when they're feeling subjectively hungry yeah so okay that's uh, it yeah cool yeah so um then kind of, yeah, so if we bring it back to our little example, the food is in the large intestine at this, at this point. Um, you're looking at the large intestine as a way that you um, absorb micronutrients and water as well, which is very important. Yeah. Latter stages of digestion, which may not be as important for the people in this, <laughs> uh, for, for, yeah, for this kind of podcast. But I currently have uh, a two-year-old two grandson in the house. I'm very aware of the latter stages at the at this present moment in time yeah exactly exactly <laughs> um and i'm sure any of the parents are just having you know vietnam like ptsd flashback <laughs> right now um so but you're looking at um you know this is being 
a, a, a big factor of this and how this progresses through yeah. the digestion process, small intestine, large intestine, is the amount of fiber that's taken in. Right. So this is also a very big po portion that we look at for kids. Uh, it's very important that because a lot of the f snack foods that are marketed towards them, the one that they enjoy the most, they are not high in fiber. Um, and a lot of, you know, um, I'm not sure what the statistic is anymore. I can't remember. But I know that in North America, specifically in Canada, our kids are malnourished in terms of their fiber intake. Okay. They're eating really low fiber. And that's very popular if you look at, actually, I was working with a group of kids here um and you know they they all are sorry they're not kids they're i mean teens older teens right there yep. a lot of them have an issue with constipation well i said i wouldn't talk about hey. the latter part that impacts your performance um feeling heavy feeling like yep. you know you need to go to the restroom is not a fun thing to be thinking about instead of thinking about your performance and how you're gonna play on court so um, and that has to do with fiber. Uh, both there's two types, soluble and insoluble, and the way they help you reabsorb more water, or um, the way they help push the food through. Um, they have multiple functions as f uh, fiber, and I would love to get into more detail mm. about that. Um, but this was kind of just like a quick, quick synopsis. Yeah, terrific. Um, but but yeah, it's a very big factor, and uh, parents should start okay. monitoring that. You know, maybe taking the steps to find out what their child at their age and their height and their weight, what they should be taking in, in terms of fiber, in terms of um, carbs, proteins, fats, right? And getting the education they need in order to help make them, yeah. uh, make those educated, informed decisions. Um, so anyway, when we get through the large intestine, that's where we've got um, our ma micronutrients, our vitamins, minerals, waters, um, all of our um, nutrients have kind of been absorbed. You're looking at at least five to 11 hours five to 11 hours, yeah. not minutes, hours. Uh, so it takes a really long time, something people don't expect. Uh, another thing people don't expect is, you know, when they say, oh man, you know, they talk about, this happens a lot and people won't admit it, but you you might get a giggle out of it. You know, people are talking about what happened when they're, they're like, you know, they got wrecked by that fast food joint, that Mexican place or that Indian food. Uh, and it took, you know, yep. it took a lot out of their stomach in the restroom. <laughs> um, but in reality, it takes 24 hours to 36 hours. Yeah. It can take om over a day for that to get out of your body. So odds are, you know, maybe something else is bugging your stomach yeah. um, if you're talking like two hours after. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, um, but yeah, that's pretty much how kind of digestion works. Um, are those bananas going to help you immediately? Uh, <clears throat> depends. Maybe not in terms of their energy content, um, but definitely in terms of feeling more full. Yeah, so it's that having, sensation sensation of eating it is a sensational boost more yeah. than more than it is an actual caloric boost yeah. so we've, we've talked on the, the uh, interesting just, just fascinating to hear the the length of time to absorb all the goodness out of the uh, the food that we're putting in but what happens if we can drill down to kind of you, you're part way through a match or you're just about to play a match <clears throat> what is there anything that can be taken to give that little bit of a boost or is that just a wrong place to start should you should be starting from a different place because you do tend to see kids will go on the court they'll have a quick swig of some energy providing either drink or an energy bar uh is that a good way long term probably not is that an okay way to get you through the game or <clears throat> should we not be relying on those carbohydrate or those sugar boosts but kind of fueling up better before the game um, of course, I'd recommend, you know, if you have the time, um, great. Uh, sometimes the reality is, you know, um, especially you might feel this as well. Um, Friday is a lot yeah, of yeah. times, tournaments. whether it be, I, I, I also am working with uh, some soccer players as well. I don't know if I mentioned that, but they always play Friday tournaments. Uh, and it's, you know, parents have to drive them. They'll yep. take them at three. School doesn't even end yet. So nope. they're looking at when, when are they going to properly fuel their kid. The tournament starts at 530 or whatever, and they have to drive a far distance to get there. So that's a reality that you face. Um, and as professional athletes, of course, you know, when it's your full-time job, I can definitely dedicate more time to educating people on uh, the proper timing. Uh, but sometimes you're not given that gift of time. Yeah. Um, so if you're not, of course, getting kind of whatever in your kid's stomach is, is better than nothing. 
Um, but if you have the time, I always recommend for athletes, and it and it's proven. Um, I believe is the American Ph Journal of Physiology um, that has uh, some work showing that um, four hours is kind of like the ideal time yeah. in terms of energy uptake to have a last big meal. Um, so having that meal then, and then there's a lot of work that shows across different journals that's showing uh, mm -hmm. conclusive evidence about you know snacking maybe two hours before. Yeah hour before that's assuming you know the, the athlete still feels the need to uh, and in a lot of cases this is anecdotal what I'm about to say so this might not ap apply to everyone but in a lot of cases you know you may feel hungry you may feel oh, but I need to eat something uh, whether that be for social reasons or for whatever you know because everyone around you is eating um, you know that hour and a half two hours before that's always good but it's always kind of like a small thing yeah uh, you know, a bar of course um, you know, some trail mix maybe uh, just to help it last a little bit longer, digesting with some protein yeah. and fat. Um, you know, maybe even I a good one is like a turkey sandwich um, for kids, you know, has a little bit of protein, mm. get some bread in there. You give them that, combine it with maybe even um, a popular one here in North America is, you know, like uh, peanut butter and jam. Um, it's popular this side, of the, uh, this side of the pond as well perfect so that, yeah so even even that's like not bad but of course what what's important for me to emphasize here is that that's not the main fuel yeah, yeah. that's secondary fuel yeah. that's kind of the just the top up so yeah. you want to always be fully fueled for the event and that's in case you know you maybe only filled the tank three quarters yeah um and so that yeah that would be what i kind of recommend obviously four hours before that's you know kind of the go-to time yeah. if your match starts at six you start eating at two. Yeah. Um, in certain scenarios, I'm sure you're already going to start realizing Saturday morning start times. Exactly. Saturday morning start times at 8 or 7 a.m. Um, first of all, they should be criminal if they're starting at 7 a.m. <laughs> um, but, but 8 a.m., you know, that's that's unfortunate. Yep. You can't wake up. You can't wake your kid up at 4 in the morning. All right, here we go. Let's eat. Um, Enjoy your spike bowl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, it, it doesn't work that way, right? But um, that's one of those scenarios where people, that's when people started to understand, you know, the day before as well helps. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and there's, and again, this, I could go into a lot of detail, um, but in the interest of time, you know, uh, it, and if you want more detail, feel free to contact yeah, me yeah. about this. this is, um, you know, eating two days before, the day before. Okay. This is a, Concept called carb loading. Yep. Um, very important leading up to a match because um, that one meal doesn't make or break, as I mentioned yep. at the beginning of the podcast. Um, the one meal does not make or break. It is a lot to do with um, you, how you've eaten a few days before, you know, maybe even 48, up to 48 hours before. Yep. Yeah, I remember uh, it's interesting you saying that kind of leading up to it because obviously these guys would have done. Um, but I, I heard a, an interview once with David Beckham he used to when he was at Manchester United, and they used to talk about uh, what's the what's the one worst thing about being a, a Premier League football star? And he said uh, spaghetti bolognese for breakfast when you got a lunchtime kickoff, and uh, you know that that kind of <clears throat> loading up that early with kind of food that isn't what's meant for breakfast. But uh, can we can we look at a, a couple of scenarios? Just just was interested to go through uh, with you your your advice you'd give to us as parents because as parents listening, all of our kids will be at different stages in their sports. Will have different yep. commitments uh, both on time. So I, I broke it down to looking at either you've got a, a designated time in the day. You know the match is going to be something like two hours long. Uh, <clears throat> another scenario would be. Uh, you've got a whole day blocked out and particularly with tennis some matches go longer some shorter so you can't guarantee when the games are going to be but there'll be shorter matches to try and get more matches in during the during the day how do you fuel up for something that's going to go on protractedly that long how how about an all weekender uh, it doesn't sound like a, a weekend away with the lads but actually when you start getting onto more senior levels particularly in, in tennis tournaments can last for a full weekend and into the beginning part of the week so how, <clears throat> how are we looking after the fueling up for that long? Um, uh, and then my last question is, and we'll come back to these just one by one. My last one will be just around the scenario of very conscious of, is there any tips around fueling up that will help with concentration? 
uh, that kind of the match is starting to go on waning it's not just the legs that get tired the mind starts to wander a little so if we could just go back to the first one there's a two hour match we have a sp- we know exactly when it's going to start because there's nothing dependent before or after it um, how should we be fueling up if that's the correct term to help our kids get through that match and be able to perform and peak well um awesome uh so yeah i'll try to break them down then like one yeah. by one because they're very different scenarios um but in the first scenario you've got a two-hour match yeah uh, obviously eating having that big meal four hours before that would be ideal um if it's a if we're talking um the early morning 10 a.m something like it, very often either a 10 a.m or there might be a 2 p.m match yeah right um, so breakfast is obviously the most important meal of the day. Yeah. Um, I would recommend, you know, if it's a 10 AM, wake up at six. Yeah. That's, you know, uh, it, in the reality of things is teaching your kid that, and you can get me to talk to them if they don't believe the parents. <laughs> Sometimes they don't, but waking up at 6 AM is necessary to be what they want to be. And yeah. that's a professional athlete. If you think about it, these guys wake up at six, they have a hit beforehand yeah. And then, you know, rest and then warm up again and get ready yeah. to play by the time 10 a.m. comes around. So thinking about it that way, there's a lot to get done beforehand. Mm. But having that set aside, talking breakfast, um, breakfast will be equally as important for, a you know, a two o'clock start as a 10 o'clock yeah. start. Just be, it'll just be a, later in the day. So you're looking at foods that are like um, high in carbohydrates, lower in fats, a little less fried food. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're not looking to um, pick up something from that billion-dollar Golden Arch company on the way to the match. That's just uh, for dad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Tell the kids that. It's only for the adults. Uh, so you're looking at foods that are typically uh, low in the glycemic index, yep. index preferably. So what that means is staying away from things like um, I mean, it's important that you also have high glycemic index and you kind of have everything along the spectrum, but I guess I should inform you what that is. Uh, low, low glycemic index is uh, something that takes a little longer to absorb in yep. your body uh, as a carbohydrate and uh, high glycemic index is a lot faster acting and it's life throughout is very quick throughout yeah. your body is very quick um i'll give you an example of both just to kind of yeah. help outline that. Uh, something that's lower would be something like a like an oat so um, porridge exa- yeah so like a porridge yeah, exactly yeah. Um, and something that would take a little uh that would be higher or would take less time would be like your orange juice or yeah Orange juice is very high on the glycemic index, actually. Um, so the, while now you know having those is very important, I would also say while we're talking about that, that packing your kid's bag with a snack that is low glycemic index, a bar, um, you know, something like um, I don't know, like a banana bread. Yeah. Um, if, if you're able to buy something like that for your kid you know pastries aren't always unhealthy they're just unhealthy for adults because they made them unhealthy (laughs) Uh, and also you know also looking at something like fruit as the high glycemic Mm -hmm. index fruit very high glycemic index that's not to say that it's bad for you it it just serves a different purpose yeah yeah. fruit is good for you we can all agree that it's very good for you Uh, and i would always recommend that they eat a, a high diet in fruits um because you want to ensure that your kid has at least 30 to 60 grams of carbohydrates before a match. Okay. Uh, and that combination with – that's kind of like my ballpark, you know, average range for a, a kid. Um, obviously, if your child is smaller, and closer towards 30, they have yeah. less of an app, maybe closer towards 30. Uh, but, of course, preferring whole foods. Uh, and then if it's – you know, a kid who you're like, man, this kid could eat everything in the kitchen and still not have enough. Well, then that's closer to 60, 70 <laughs> in combination with proteins. Um, of course, you know, maybe uh, it's not the worst to add some, you know, maybe some bacon or whatever, yeah. uh, turkey sausage or turkey bacon as well. Those are some lower fat options. Um, but then there's also um, things like, you know, adding nuts to the porridge. Yep. Um, and and also you can use porridge is very good for adding fruits and you can add things like uh, seeds and various different things that are high in fiber that help as well. Yeah. Uh, and that that actually does aid in the um, length providing that proper length of energy that they that they need. 
Um, so again, that would be very dependent on the individual, but that would be kind of my outline for yeah. that scenario, so, if you will. So, so how about the the scenario of it's going to be a whole day? Dependent on how successful they are on their matches, depends on how long they stay for that day. There could be a potential of three or four matches, the fourth one being maybe the final. Uh, so you've got one, one and a half hour, maybe bursts, probably an hour bursts needed several times during the day. How do we fuel up well for, for a day like that? Yeah, um, and this is very prominent in things like uh, tennis where they have the quick, quick sets. or Yeah, the, yeah the, the fast fours, yeah. Fast fours, yeah, yeah, yeah fast fours. So the set's up to four. Um, so these are very fast matches um, where you might think, oh, I don't really need to worry about it. But it does it does have a big um, yeah. toll on your head. Um, and so obviously fueling up the exact same way you would for a full match because they're probably going to play the same amount, if not a little bit more even, yeah. um, in terms of the hours on court um, or time on court. Um, but definitely fueling up and making sure, you know, I'm going to stress this over and over and over again. It's preparation, preparation, preparation. There won't be a canteen all yeah, the time. Yeah, yeah. There won't be a cafeteria. There won't be a restaurant nearby. Uh, you can't always rely on that for your kid. Um, going to the grocery store is also often your cheapest bet. Grabbing yep. some fruit they like, making sure that they have at least one or two pieces of fruit between every match um, of something they like. If they like apples, give them apples. If they like pears, great. Get them a pear. These are all, again, high yeah. in fiber, but also, um, or higher in fiber foods than what they would originally be snacking on or comparatively, um, but also very high in carbohydrates um, for what they are, um, especially if you're looking at things like watermelon or, or strawberries and stuff like that. Um, just, you know, the prep time is not a lot. It's just mm -hmm. a plastic bag or a container for the food, uh, as well as, you know, I mentioned earlier before, maybe something like a turkey sandwich, something yeah. with protein. Um, you know, if they're a vegetarian, there are other options. You can make wraps with vegetables, uh, you know, throw in some cauliflower, some broccoli, um, some dark leafy greens. Um, you could do that with, even if yep. it's not a, um, a vegetarian, but making sure that you get some, something that's high in protein and mixing in, uh, again, legumes and pulses, uh, pulses are very important, uh, beans, chickpeas, that kind of yep. stuff. Um, throwing in those is a good source of protein as well. Think considering vegetarian options in between matches is very good. Um, it's always very good, but it's incredibly um, efficient in athletes because they're lower in fat. Especially yeah. when you have such a fast turnaround, they don't have the same level of fat that something like a red meat would have. Yeah. Um, so you don't have to worry about the length of time that it will take. Um, in order to provide that energy for the athlete. Because it's been um, interesting to hear a lot of the athletes, uh, particularly uh, promoting a, a vegan diet. And so, so you think of Djokovic, uh, and then quite interesting, a lot of the NFL players and rugby players themselves. So it's uh, these rather large chaps bounding around the pitches as well. Uh, you know, promoting a vegan-based diet as giving them more energy uh, for them to play. So it's it's interesting that what, particularly if you look at rugby, very much a red meat. Uh, I guess if you're going to describe food groups and a, and a sport, yeah. but yet there's a whole lot of these international uh, players now, uh, you know, promoting a vegetarian or a vegan based diet because it's actually giving them the more energy than they found with a meat based diet. Yeah, um, you know, it's funny. It, it's tough. I, I would never say, "Hey, this is the diet for your no, kid." It's just uh, what works. Every kid is very different. Every person is. Different. It's just what works for them. If that works for them, great. Yeah. Uh, the reason why I recommend something uh, like vegetarian or vegan is it's without thinking you are providing lower fat. Yes. Because vegetables and whole foods, as opposed to red meats, the moment you eat the red meat, it might have you know 10 grams of fat in it, uh, depending on the portion or whatever. Whereas yeah. the vegetables have none, um, mm. especially if they're not prepared in any way. Um, they'll have maybe you'll have a one gram for that entire wrap, one gram of fat versus the um, ten grams in the in the meat. Which fat is not a bad thing. Fat is a very good thing, especially for um, prolonging things for a longer period of time for your triathlons, yeah. for your uh, endurance athletes, for your um, soccer players as well, stuff like that. You do want to have some sorts of fat, but you know you also get that in pulses. You'll get a little bit in there. Um, but it's very important that you're looking at these athletes, like especially footballers, they're um, they're struggling to maintain weight. Like they're they're full adults. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
maintaining the way they look, the way they feel, the way they perform is very important. So it's you can eat brainlessly, we'll call it, on a vegan diet and be able to have lower fat. However, you'll struggle with protein. Um, you'll really have to think about protein, but at least, you know, if you're eating, for example, a meat, a kind of carnivore diet, if all you're eating is kind of the meat and stuff like that, you're getting fat no matter what, everywhere yeah. you, every yeah. you turn. Um, well, you're also getting the protein. There's obviously, you're, you're seeing yeah. pros and cons, yeah. but um, it's finding that balance. But I would recommend between matches for sure. You know, you're looking at um, shorter periods of time. Um, something that is lower in fat, you know, staying under 10 grams of fat probably, yeah. but depending on the kid, obviously, but staying under 10 grams of fat so that they're not uh, um, yakking on the court. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely staying away from overly large hot chocolate. Um, so yeah. so we've kind of looked at that. So is that the same kind of principles that you look for a long weekend? So kind of tournament uh, progressing through the weekend, just kind of look with a low fat? Um, yeah, if you're looking at like a match a day for like a week, yeah. uh, kind of that's, that's that's more or less the style of ITF tournaments nowadays, yep. I think. It is. Um, but yeah, that's kind of... The way it is is you treat every day as as a separate event, right? So you've got want to make sure you're pre fueled, yep. you're intra fueled, intra meaning during, and you're post fueling. Um, so making sure that you have a distinct way of doing all of these three things. Um, obviously, again, preparation, preparation, preparation. Yep. If you're not actually physically preparing the food uh, in order to have good timing, you also want to at least write it down. Hey, this is my plan. Yeah. Uh, and if you have to stray from the plan, that's okay. But having some sort of idea in mind gives you a benchmark or a place to go. All right, hey, I wanted I wanted to have one protein, one grain, one um, or two or three vegetables and fruits. Uh, and then you say, okay, specifically though, I wanted strawberries. I don't know, strawberries, yep. uh, spinach, and um, green pea, green pea, peas. Sorry. Okay, well, green peas are not available at the market today, so I'm just gonna have to go home and cry. Yep. No, you can just go and pick up something else that's similar, right? Yep. Um, and or in that same category, and then you're at least ballpark doing the same thing um, because you had the plan, you knew yep. w where you kind of were. So, what? What is? Is there any food groups so uh, you'd recommend? To, just the other bit on that was around concentration, because one of the things. Or is concentration purely linked with energy levels? Um, I don't want to say I don't know. Yeah. Um, but it's not. You know, you you sent me this question, and I, I most of the other questions, you know, I'm very prepared with. I know because the research is there, and it's been there for a while, and I've yeah. you know read up on it, and uh, but this one, I you know, I was doing some extensive work and there's not much of a link or there's not a conclusive link to any specific types of foods okay. um, or any specific types of nutrients, I yeah. should say. Um, but there is, you know, it is that energy level. If, yeah, yeah. if athletes, are, if athletes are low in energy level, that's when you start seeing yeah. them um, kind of crumble, uh, breaking rackets, you know, yep. start shouting, kicking goal posts in soccer, you know, whatever, whatever it is that they do, stomping the ground, throwing a tantrum. A lot of that does stem from being low energy. Uh, and that's where that banana had you eaten yep. it at the beginning of the match would have been good helpful or, or at halftime. Right. Um, so it, it's just kind of staying ahead instead of lagging behind and yeah. trying doing it proactively rather than retroactively. Sure. So, so what about um, post match? You've had, uh, you even let's go to the full conclusion. You, you've your tournament is finished. Sure. Um, what, what are you recommending, kind of uh, intake then to kind of help the body recover after its exertion? Um, so you're looking to hopefully. There's actually been like a lot of controversy around this uh, <laughs> metabolic window they call it. Yeah. Um, and what I and I even like within the last week, just so that I reread on it and was refreshed on what the research was showing uh, it's still showing the research is still there saying that you know there is the potential for increased um, uptake of nutrients during 30 minutes within 30 minutes okay. after complete exercise uh, but this is not specific to protein uh, which is kind of where a lot of the controversy is um, is it just protein that you're absorbing more no yeah. it's everything 
Um, so everything is being absorbed, and and if you know if you eat carbohydrates in excess as an adult, this isn't a bit really a problem for someone like Elijah, for yeah. example. But um, if you're eating in excess carbs, it'll store as fats. Yeah. So understanding that if you are eating a crazy amount right after, just to, you know, get it in you, and you don't need it, it'll store. Um, yeah. Not proteins. Proteins are generally um, through a couple of different processes excreted out of the body. Uh, fats are also stored, but proteins are not yeah um but but yeah making sure sorry i guess to answer your question it, it's making sure you do have a high you know protein meal something you know 20 to 30 grams at least 15 depending on the kid um if you're looking at children at least 15 grams of protein and you know the same kind of 30 to 60 grams of carbohydrates after uh, just to replenish what they've lost yeah. carbohydrates are the most important your body runs on carbohydrates and being scared of them is not good. Low yep. carb diet will not be good for your kid. Do not put your kid on a low carb diet. All of the research shows that it is not beneficial. Um, so, if you want to, you know, I, this is kind of the one thing I tell people is, if you want to put your kid, or if you want to put your kid on a keto diet, you know, because I don't yep. know, you think they need it for their performance. I always tell them, you put yourself on a keto diet. Hold off on the kid. You be the guinea pig. Yep. You be the Hey, let me know how angry or upset you start getting um, the, the day you, you know, maybe don't hit your target. Two days you don't hit yeah. your target, you start noticing your weight go right back up again. Um, so it, it is kind of, I'm not, sorry, trying to knock. No, no, no. The, in general, um, it's for some people, they find that they work very well. But again, that's anecdotal evidence. There's no conclusive evidence no. that a low-carb diet helps, specifically high-protein, high-fat. Um, in fact, there's the opposite. There's some evidence that is showing that it's very um, poor for body um, body so, energy levels. So we've body. we've been we've been talking a lot on kind of replenishing the body. One of the big ways of, I guess, replenishment is sleep. And as we chatted previously, this is something that you talk a lot to the athletes that you support around sleep. Now, most parents now will start to raise and roll their eyes uh, at this conversation uh, about trying, one of the biggest challenges in life is encouraging our lovely little darlings uh, to embrace sleep. But what, what is what is the advice or what is the conversations you're having with athletes around the importance of sleep? Okay, uh, I'm gonna say something very controversial now. Um, all the parents who want to get at me with a pitchfork, again, you have <laughs> um, a great thing while it's, you know, often joked about, you know, the sugar high yeah. kids get. Um, sugar high is actually a placebo effect. Okay. Um, Kids don't actually receive a sugar high. They're just very excited of something they, they enjoy uh, eating. So whether it be Nutella or whatever it is that they're yep. eating, they're not, they're, you know, they're not just, it's not from the Nutella that they have the spark of energy. And that's why it fades. It fades because it was just excitement. Okay. They like the hot chocolate. They like the whatever it is. And so, um, and a good reason why, you know, depending on how excited they get, they can vomit as well because then you can't <laughs> If you're if you're excited or very very cold, your stomach and your digestive system does not function properly. Um, so that being said, um, there's actually, if you look at the current literature, it's showing that uh, high carbohydrate diets are what, um, or high car carbohydrate diets in general, but also specific to like time close to bedtime, yep. uh, is very beneficial uh, in shortening that sleep latency. Uh, which is a term used to describe the time it takes to get to sleep. Yep. Um, so while a lot of research and current literature that shows uh, that high protein diets uh, it may result in kind of improved sleep quality, um, their high carb diets are very um, prominent in getting the kid to bed quicker. Okay. So parents, if you think that doesn't work, believe me, try it. Uh, and then let me know. But then there's also a ton of research, um, you know, on very specific, you know, people obviously have struggles with getting to bed, and this is a serious problem for a lot, but uh, there's a lot of, um, you know, ways to improve sleep quality and, and kind of current uh, nutrition um, interventions that are put yep. in place to uh, increase um, sleep quality and quantity. Uh, high fat diet before bed is not one of them. Um, High fat diets may negatively affect sleep quality. Um, they, there's research, and you can look this up, I'm sure. Um, in I believe the uh, the Gatorade Sport Institute um, or Sport Science Institute (GSSI) they 
they kind of did, uh, and a lot of this, all of this information should be there, just maybe paraphrased a little yeah. differently by me, but uh, it, it shows, you know, all of this information, the high fat, the, uh, so if anything you missed, go visit the Gatorade Sport, Inst- Sport Science Institute, uh, their website, but um, yeah, so it'll affect their sleep time and via, you know, tossing and turning and stuff like that during the night, so there are a couple that are very popular, and I'm going to name two of them, the, yeah. it's, uh, it's diets with uh, tryptophan in it um, so because of certain brain uh, receptors and how you know the hormones and chemicals work in your brain um, tryptophan is something that you can find in pumpkin and um, even turkey and stuff like that and uh, it's actually shown that eating you know a diet with maybe 200 grams of pumpkin or like the seeds sorry 200 yeah. grams of pumpkin seeds or, or or even I think it was 300 grams of turkey, um, an hour before bed is shown uh, and have conclusive evidence to to be aiding in your sleep latency, so decreasing your sleep latency the time that it takes for you to get to bed. All of a sudden, parents all... around the world are pressing pause and rushing to their nearest uh, supermarket or Whole Foods stores. Yeah, get to Whole Foods <laughs> and get a handful of pumpkin seeds and throw it somewhere in some food that is high carb. <laughs> Force feed that. Um, and so there's a lot, there's also, again, you guys can read up on it more if you'd like, but there's a lot of evidence, you know, showing that the foods um, fare better uh, in terms of helping sleep quality and yeah. sleep, uh, shortening uh, sleep latency than liquids, their yeah. liquid counterparts. Um, so understanding that, you know, the food is better for your kid to get to bed than something like a milk. They've actually shown that a glass of milk is not going to help it's just kind of a placebo effect not that it's not going to help but it it doesn't actually shorten your sleep latency um and then also melatonin was another one and i'm sure people have uh, heard of that it it that it helps with um it's kind of associated with circadian rhythm uh melatonin um and while i don't Mm -hmm. i don't personally know a lot about melatonin yet um i do know that having about a gram for a kid a gram serving um as a supplement perhaps or via food as well um it might help in your overall quality of sleep yeah uh, you know for more serious sleep disorders maybe not but um it should help keep the kid to sleep and it kind of helps uh bring about the natural movement of the REM cycle yeah uh, via the circadian rhythm so. yeah so what uh, so, so- so, so, so in all of this, just kind of wanted to come into land where, where of time for yourself because you've got to, you've got to shoot in a minute. Is, is there, is there anything yeah. that we've discussed that particularly uh, comes to the fore when supporting young athletes going through puberty or major growth spurts or, or that kind of the like? As, as adolescents truly are physically and emotionally growing, uh, yeah. and their need for nutrition. Yeah, a big, uh, big leader, and actually there's a ton of research on this, um, uh, but a big leader in uh, funding this research and, and kind of not even not funding it, but, you know, uh, kind of getting it rolling is uh, the Indian Journal of Endocrinology and Metabolism. Yeah. Uh, they've actually done a ton of work showing that nutrition affects puberty in various different ways, but uh, the most important is kind of having high-fat diets, uh, more specifically, you know, I guess not more specifically, but kind of more relatably, things like um, fast food diets yeah. uh, does affect um, puberty and natural movement of it. Um, and while some parents, you know, they uh, I, I hear this a bit, and I don't know if this is relevant to you, but uh, kids that are very athletic and kids that exercise often, kids that eat healthier, yeah, um, then are late bloomers. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, and so if you're looking at that and thinking, oh gosh, my kid, you know, he's He's 14, still hasn't had his growth spurt, or 13, it's not a bad thing. Yeah. It's a very good thing to be a late bloomer um, and for various reasons, but um, it's shown they have conclusive evidence that shows that um, any high-fat diets um, or any kids that are high-fat diets, particularly in girls, it brings upon puberty quicker, mm. uh, and so they end up you know, gaining the body hair, the the deeper voice and all that kind of stuff at an earlier age, it's for earlier onset. Um, and, you know, 
it, it's kind of that they're seeing that the heavy processed high fat foods are kind of bringing this on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that that's kind of that's kind of where the research is at currently. Um, again, overweight children are also more often uh, more likely to bring um, to be sorry to to bring upon puberty earlier. Um, so yeah, it's not a bad um, not a bad thing to have a late blooming kid. It nope. means that they're their micronutrients, their macronutrients are kind of um, where they need to be. They're eating all healthy foods um, and they're exercising well. So that's a, a very good thing. Great. So, so last question. This has been this has been fascinating. I've been scribbling down 101 notes uh, as we've been going through here. Uh, and uh, just the last question, really, from for me uh, on this is. Sure. Are there any kind of top tips? I don't know whether you got top five, top three, whatever it would be. Top tips for us as courtside parents around this whole area of nutrition, particularly as a lot of the the listeners who have been drawn to this podcast will be thinking about what we might crudely call fueling our kids up so they can enjoy the sport that they they particularly love. What would be some of your main tips, even if it's repeating yeah. what you've said? But let's reaffirm them. Yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, I'll definitely be probably repeating myself, but and even I've had to write a couple yeah. of these down thinking, what are the things that bother me about how things are done currently and where do I think they can improve? Yeah. Um, or just, you know, what, what do I think is important that people don't consider sometimes? Yeah. Um, educating them. Uh, I talked about this at the beginning. This is what I do is I educate them to make them the ones that make the informed decision. Um, there's a lot of research that shows that after the age of five, kids are the ones making the majority of their decisions in terms yeah. of what they consume, especially when they go off to school. You might notice, you know, hey, some things are coming back in the lunch, but the kid yep. said he's full. Cool, so, uh, so, so you kind of start noticing that, and, and it's true, right? So, uh, let them make the decision. Never force them to eat healthy, but obviously make them understand that eating healthy is different from. Um, yep eating unhealthy foods, whatever. Healthy is also a vague term, uh, whatever you kind of want to envision healthy being. Um, but make it fun. Remember that they're kids. Yeah. Uh, you can make yeah. eating healthy fun. And so I brought this to show right here. Um, it's along with my uh, tea on the plate here. We've got a pumpkin loaf. Yep. It tastes like similar to banana bread. Again, high in pumpkin. Yep. Pumpkin seed content, very high in tryptophan, which would get me to sleep. Making that, baking that with your kid on a you know, Saturday afternoon, having that as a snack before going to bed, it'll help them. Their body will like it. They'll enjoy it. It's a treat. It's fun. You can also make uh, no-bake protein bars, and I'll get those up on my website. It's, website's not up and running yet, but hopefully by the time this podcast yep. is up, it will be. Um, but yeah, it's things like that. It's making it fun. Enjoy, like in bringing the social aspect of food to your kid is very important yeah. for them to understand the benefits of food. The more that they're around it, the more that they're educated by it in fun ways, the better they will react to it. Um, so, you know, um, saying things like, I don't know, you know, bake, again, baking with them, uh, teaching them about maybe even plant-based dishes. Uh, there's for some reason, there's like kids don't believe that there is anything, any protein in anything but meat. Yeah. Uh, that, that, that's kind of a funny concept to me, but um, understanding that there is teaching the, the combinations of proteins because, you know, there is amino acid profiles. So again, yep. if you, something like that might be on, on my media in the future, but um, understanding protein and how it's uh, absorbed and how you get it differently from animal versus plant proteins. You know, understanding you're not the best one to do it. That's probably my biggest takeaway is you may not be the best person to teach your kids. Yep. While you may be sternest or the funnest individual ever, um, well, funnest isn't a word, but um, <laughs> you kind of get the point. Um, you know, you, you might still be saying, hey, well, you know, my kid doesn't listen to me. Yeah. Well, that may be true. Kids aren't likely to want to listen to their parents because nope. their parents are there all the time. Uh, I don't have any evidence that backs that statement <laughs> that they're. Um, I do. <laughs> while, while I do run, while I do run an evidence-based nutrition practice, I'm not. Uh, I've got nothing on that. But you're, those people are not the only ones. You can yeah. use different ways. You involve their friends. Bring you know, 
maybe they have that cousin that they enjoy involve the cousin you know whoever it is bring family and friends along with it for the ride so you can enjoy it in a very social setting but that is the best way to teach a yeah, kid yeah. they learn from experiences they learn from tasting they learn from trying things um so bringing definitely a social aspect to it and making sure they are the one making the decision yeah. by empowering your kid they are more likely to do what's right um, whereas if you take it away from them, they are more likely to want what was taken away from mm. them, um, which is your Nutella or your Haribo snacks that maybe like, you know, they're sneaking off in the back. And then that this is how you get things like eating disorders and a lot of the things that I have also had to deal with. Um, and I don't say like it's a bad thing. Some people have it regardless of their scenario might be different, but that is a way that it happens. And it's a very sad thing for a kid at the age of, you know, 13 or 14 to have an eating disorder. It makes me upset, yep. you know, um, that I hate to say that some people are poor parents, but just support your kid. That's yep. your job. Yeah. Uh, that's why you brought that kid into the world and then let them make the decisions. They're old enough, no matter what their age is, if they're over five, they're old enough to make the decision on food. Just give them or maybe just all good options. Yes. That's another thing, right? Like if you give them options that are McDonald's and Wendy's and Subway, all right, kid, go. Well, they're not going to have many good no. options versus you can say, hey, I know this takes a lot more time and, you know, maybe pressing and you can't always do it, but hey, saying, all right, quinoa salad or, uh, you know, what was the pasta, bolognese yep. uh, or, um, or steak and vegetables, you know, it, those are all good options letting them choose which is yes. best for them that's just a preference yeah. right so things like that. that that would be kind of my take big takeaway there and i think that's a fantastic way for us to uh, to finish this absolutely enthralling podcast just empower your kids to make the right choices uh mm -hmm. that's and it has been absolutely fantastic uh, spending the past hour or so with you absolutely loved it just for our well, listeners again how can people get a hold of you if they want to contact you to take this conversation further for themselves of course, yeah, for sure. Um, you can definitely contact me via um, I'm the big social media way, Instagram, uh, yep. at Edin Sohovic Nutrition, uh, E-D-I-N-S-E-H-O-V-I-C, Nutrition. Yep. Um, and uh, Another way is Edin Sohovic Nutrition, that same at line, dot com. Yep. Um, that's, another, that's another way to get on my website. It should be up by then. If not, give it a couple days, guys. I'm so sorry. Uh, it's taking a little bit. <laughs> Uh, but I do work uh, a lot, so so it, it is kind of taking a little bit of time. But I do appreciate it. Reach out whenever. I'd be happy, you know, to just have a conversation with you, uh, have a call, have a chat, um, and move forward from there. And I hope I hope many people take you up on that offer. Edin, thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute privilege. No, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Cheers. All thank the best. You. Good luck with Elijah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> How can I start the sentence without going? And for me, what other words can I use? I always go, well, what I really liked was... I'm recording now, we could have that been. Oh. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so welcome to the courtside uh, post-match reflection with Kath and I. And Kath is currently racking her brains to know how to start the sentence without the usual... No, what I was thinking is, this is the Christmas special, and now I'm thinking about Christmas dinner, and I'm wondering... Do I need to adjust our menu in some way to accommodate what I've learned about nutrition? But I think we'll just stick with the current. No, I, 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 I enjoy the post-Christmas lunch slump of James Bond and snoozing. I definitely slow down after Christmas dinner. That won't be changing, I don't think. Never mind. Anyway. Um, so I think what I got from Eddie was let's not do a full roast uh, before a match. That might not be productive no i haven't got any matches planned have you <laughs> no not at all you know what, what did you what did you get out of uh today's podcast um i think it made it made me reflect actually on my own experience when i was in my early 20s i suffered with chronic fatigue and me and i remember with the consultants that i'd seen actually how very much a part of the recovery process was a review and a change in or you know a review and a thought process about what I was eating at different points in the day it wasn't necessarily that I was eating badly by any means but it was Gosh, a case of I was cooking well that's true you were cooking um but actually just about <clears throat> excuse me uh just about the don't laugh at me 
You're laughing at me. You're going to edit that bit out? No, keep going. You're going to edit that out. Um, and actually, I always remember being told about the, the high protein breakfast, certainly for me. Um, so I still carry that on today, having, I always have two eggs every morning for breakfast, yep. uh, scrambled poached with uh, a couple of tomatoes as well. So that sounds a bit healthy, doesn't it? Everyone yes. laughs at work that I'm always a two egg day two egg a day person uh, but for me that's made such a massive difference yep. um, in terms of my energy levels uh, throughout the day um, so I think uh, again just thinking even at his age that education and working out for him what's the right pattern in a day of his eating habits and what he eats uh, it was just really really helpful just to yep. bring that back to the, th- the forefront of thinking and part of my thinking around that education was he will hear it from us and go yeah yeah get the cocoa pops but if if how the value of having someone like an Edin mm. in your child's life, who they will look up to, that significant other influence in their life, to say no, no, you really do need to start eating these things. So to try and find a way where it removes the battle of dad now wants me to eat something that I don't. Mm. Whereas if you've got someone like Edin or someone else at the club who's older, who your child looks up to, and they are modelling uh, a food consuming routine that's a little bit more helpful than what maybe your child is maybe that role model is the better person to start the conversation because what Edin keeps on talking about through the podcast was educate them so that they are making healthy choices Mm. it's not uh, one long nag fest from us to try to get them to eat the stuff that actually the minute we open our mouths we know this is now just a battle Mm. Yeah, and I think I think it's them being at a certain age, isn't it? I, we can reflect and think, okay, maybe we could have educated him differently on eating habits at different ages. He doesn't eat badly by any means, but no. there's things we could do more of, less of, and and all of that. But I think again, it's it's just that, uh, and there's a lot at the moment. It feels like in in terms of education and in terms of awareness in the you know the news about people's diets, the impact and. Uh, I think you know we're seeing isn't it the knock-on effect yeah. isn't it of the choices that we make and our poor bodies the more I think about what gets churned in there um, and all the poor old duodenum and all the rest of it isn't it what it has to yeah. process um, it's pretty grim when you think about it so actually sort of viewing your body in a uh, a different way isn't it and about actually what's right for the body yeah. and what's good for it um, and treating it you know in that respectful way and sport then becomes not just healthy for the physical activity you're doing if your child is aspiring to get to the final or to make it through the 90 minutes of the football match or whatever, and they are noticing in matches that at 70 minutes they're dropping off, they're noticing at semi-finals they're always losing because energy level drops, there is then a genuinely honest conversation to say, you love this sport, you want to achieve, you therefore need to do A, B and C. Just like you need to train, Mm. therefore you also need to fuel yourself properly. And I wonder whether for some of us as sports parents we have a slight advantage here in that if our kids really want this then this is part of them showing mm. that they really want it. Yeah. Uh, and it's an encouraging, it's more of a carrot mm. instead of a, to use food metaphors there. I was going to say, very good, as Thank opposed you. to a chocolate bar. Pa- uh, well, that's for us on court side. Okay. So are there anything specific from that he mentioned that he thought that was that was a good bit of learning? Yeah, I think I think that, that four hour rule, yeah. um, but equally around, you know, what, what you have eaten, how much of that when you're on court is that meal before or, you know, whether... A, the top up snack and just that kind of understanding about uh what you what you have pre-match and at what sort of timing um but equally about you know whether it's liquid and that combination is it liquid solid depending what it is so just that thinking it through a little bit more uh i thought was really really helpful um i'm not convinced um i will opt for a 6 (laughs) a.m wake up of my of my son uh for a 10 o'clock match but i think equally that is a thought process and an awareness isn't it if that's that's the reality further down the line if this journey continues for him um but at this stage again just that thought process you know if you're getting tired on court why is that there's a good chance it's because the fuel's not quite right or we haven't found the right mix uh with him but then on a a very practical side the after we'd record this uh, week or two ago we had a tournament two days later Mm. and i know ed and saying it's not one meal that then makes the tournament and as we've said he doesn't eat too disastrously with us Mm. but on the morning we had porridge and then going there i had made some banana bread he's done well he has made since in the last two weeks he's made five banana loaves come on and he's gone nuts for baking so um yeah we're a bit banana down now because one of the battles with him is uh, after a match and you got another match eat a banana he doesn't want he doesn't like the texture of a banana that much but he does like the flavour of it so actually having a he'll eat cake 
So actually, a, a bit more of it. Uh, granted, it's full of sugar, but you know, a <laughs> banana loaf was something that actually. And then that tournament, he played four matches and he got to the final. He didn't win it, but he got to the final. And his energy levels all the way through were yeah, higher steady, yeah. than mm-hmm. what we'd noticed before with our subtle kind of injections of all sugary based treats. Mm. And so there was something really practical that we got out from from Eddings of that base fueling some porridge. He's not a mad fan of it, but he got the gist of why we were doing it. And then kind of helping him to eat and drink more sensibly in between the games, he started to notice his energy levels were going. So then there's an incentive there for us to say, well, if it worked last time, should we do it again? Mm. Uh, And it's encouraging him to eat a little bit more appropriately. Yeah. And I think equally as well, it felt like Edwin was really realistic isn't it that there isn't this one model that we're all trying to aspire to and you know i'm very aware that you know veganism um is very much of the moment and and that's great and obviously is suiting and working for a lot of people and high profile athletes but equally that sort of word of caution of that you know just not all heading necessarily for the same thing but a bit of trial and error isn't it finding what the right diet um and right sort of food groups are for your both for yourself as an adult but equally for your children And uh, the, the last bit for me was normally for us as a household, Friday night is kind of uh, treat night with whatever food they want to eat. But if he's got a tournament on the Saturday, why don't we knock the treat night to, to the Saturday night instead of it being the Friday night? Or be really evil and have one treat night a year. That's is that just, awful? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just move on. That's great. That's evil parenting moment. He woke me up very early today. Yeah, yeah. He's not, but he's, I think that's fair now with, mm. with the time we woke up this morning. And he didn't bring me a cup of tea. He didn't. Bang out of order. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> So, so I was just wondering uh, on that one. There, we have almost stuck religiously to Friday night is always the kind of it's the end of the week, it's the blowout night. But actually, if you got a game the next day, how many times has what he consumed on the Friday night not been helpful to his match? And not to rob him of the kind of the treat of movie night and pizzas and all the rest of it, but say, well, why don't we do that Saturday night? Mm. Yeah, because you do get a, a drop of energy. Let's see, just normally Friday. Let's see how well we do on the tournament Saturday, and then win or lose, it's pizza night Saturday mm. night, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I think any treat night is when I'm not cooking. It's so true. if it's based on his comment the other day when I made <laughs> macaroni cheese by popular demand. And his comment was? He said, it's not bad, mummy, but it's missing one thing. I said, oh, what's that? And he said, flavour. So I'm not sure, Edin, whether you do cookery <laughs> workshops as well, but um, I clearly need help. <laughs> So, Courtsiders, I hope uh, this podcast has been of help for you, uh, for you personally, uh, considering what you're consuming, uh, as well as how we fuel our kids. On all of these things, it's down to what you're able to do, uh, and uh, they can sometimes feel like a lot of pressure that we need to start picking up the new trends, and it can become a little bit OTT on some levels. But if your child is really pushing for this and really wanting it, what's the extra dynamics that we can do for them? And I hope this podcast has been helpful. As we said at the beginning, please do like, retweet, promote us. We're coming to our first year of doing the podcast. We're getting a good followership on this, but we'd like to expand it just so that more people can hear this. So please do, if you can, over the Christmas time, uh, don't give a post, don't give a Christmas card. Give a link to the podcast. Is that a rubbish idea? No, but I don't think you delivered it well. Try again. Okay, I won't. I'll just let that one go. Anyhow, from from Kath and I, have a fantastic Christmas uh, and all the best in uh, 2019. Happy Christmas.